All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of the broadcast. This is the Global Reality. I'm your host, Josh Reeves. Thank you so much for being with us. This is the Tuesday, August 22nd, 2017 edition of the broadcast. I'm back here with you. I uh, I apologize if my voice sounds weird on this broadcast. <laughs> There's a lot of people think my voice sounds weird all the time, but uh, if I'm talking low or quiet or... Uh, my voice cracks or sounds weird. I apologize. I'm just now getting my voice back. I've been, well, you know, I do radio shows, you do films and voiceovers and all that stuff. And then uh, on Friday night, I my friend took me to uh, see Marty Friedman, the guitarist formerly of Megadeth, play at a little club here in Dallas. He, uh, you know, my birthday was back in July, but you know, the concert wasn't until Friday, so my friend had got tickets for he and I to go to the show. And, uh, yeah, I just, <laughs> between talking and screaming and all the shit, and my voice, I just it completely, and you know, all the voiceover and stuff I'd already been doing, it's, it just completely blew it out, and it didn't even come back. That was Friday night, and it didn't even come back until really today. So... Um, anyway, I apologize if my voice sounds weird or I sound, you know, if I'm constantly clearing my throat and all that, I apologize. But I wanted to do a show yesterday, but it was just not happening. And I was afraid I would have done. Because you can do that, you know, you could do more damage to your voice by trying to use it before it's healed, you know. So that's that's what I'm trying not, not to do right now. Luckily, I'm not really to the point of the film yet where I'm doing a bunch of voiceovers. The stuff I've done so far has kind of been... Uh, you know, just denser, different incidental things. But, um, yeah, Marty Friedman, um, <clears throat> he, you know, he's, he's an interesting guy because if you don't know his story, he's, he played on the, he was the guitar player. Megan has had a ton of different musicians in that band, you know, but, uh, Marty Friedman played on what's considered to be, you know, their, quintessential material or you know at least the most popular and best-selling material uh and definitely encompasses the material of, of them that i'm the most you know the biggest fan of because really you want to pull it my, my, my friend it took me is a huge uh metallica fan and i'm more of a megadeth fan than a metallica fan but as i was telling him I, if you want to get really get down to it i really only like about the same amount of albums by both bands I really don't like about three three records, but I really, I mean, you know, the first three Metallica records are about all I can stomach. And, uh, and with the Megadeth records, they're, to me, the early records really aren't that great. Um, that little run of records from, like, with Marty Friedman on them from, like, uh, you know, Rust in Peace, which to me is, you know, if you only own one Megadeth album, that, I mean, that should be it. I saw somebody comment one time on YouTube. It says something like, 98% of everything you know need to know about metal guitar can be found on this record. It's kind of true. You can hear where so many people have stolen from it. But I can think of one big, the biggest offender I can think of that's just gratuitously ripped off Megadeth quite a bit was Pantera. Don't get me wrong. Being a Dallas guy and then being from here, you know, I like Pantera, but let's be honest. Listen to some of that stuff on Rust in Peace. You can hear they just totally just whole cloth ripped, ripped that stuff off. But uh, anyway, yeah, so Marty Freeman's been living in, he left um, Megadeth. He's been living in for the past 15 years in Japan. He's married to a Japanese woman, speaks fluent Japanese, and he's lying, and he's been playing J-pop music for uh, a long amount of time. And he's become a huge TV celebrity over in Japan. It's the oddest thing. Japan, you know, Japanese culture is bizarre. They like the weirdest shit. And then again, so do we. But, you know, Japan stuff, I mean, you know, come on. There, This is the country that it sold, you know, <laughs> women's, worn women's underwear and vending machines and stuff like that. I mean, that's, that's real. They sell, like, live animals for food and shit in vending machines over there. I, there's a, look it up, there's a, vend, a crab vending machine they have in Japan. It's fucked up. This vending machine with, with fucking live crabs for you to eat, you know? It's just bizarre. 
But uh, Marty Friedman, uh, like, became a massive, he's like a TV, he's like a celebrity over there, TV celebrity, speaks the language, but uh, he hasn't done any any of the, uh, you know, sort of the shredder guitar stuff in a long time. He's been, he's been doing the J-pop thing, so I, I think a lot of people wondered if he could still do it, but uh, so it was him and his solo man. I'll be honest with you, I, I, I didn't really... <laughs> I didn't really watch much of the show. I was outside and there were people out there that you know, wanted to talk about something. But you, where you were right outside, you could hear it. You know, I have like a little smoking area that's by the, right by where the stage is. So you could hear it loud and clear. But um, yeah, I was wondering, you know, what his new stuff was going to sound like. And, and it's all, the thing about it is, you know, no matter how great you are as a guitar player, you know, the it's all that instrumental stuff. I and mean, his music really did sound like anime manga soundtracks or something. It really did. It really did. It really sounded like, you know, Power Rangers soundtrack music or something. I mean, really, it did. So it was clear that the Japanese influence was there, but he did a little snippet. He only did one little snippet of a Megadeth thing and uh, in the whole show, and it was probably, you know, one of his greatest solos in Megadeth from the song Tornado of Souls. So that was really worth the whole thing. But uh, no, it was nice to, you know, it was nice to actually get to go to a, a concert for once like that, but it was it, it, that I just, you know, it doesn't matter how good of a guitar player you are. If you don't have vocal, because none of this, you know, there's some other opening bands who none of them have vocals. I don't know. It doesn't matter how much you can shred or whatever. You still have to have a song and a melody and whatever to go with it. You know, that's why I don't like dream theater it, it, because I'm a lifelong rush fan. I've been a, a rush fan since I was a kid, really. <laughs> every time I tell somebody I'm a Rush fan, every fucking time, oh, so you must be into Dream Theater too. No, I fucking hate that. Just because, <laughs> just because I like fucking Rush is not automatically mean I like fucking Queensryche because that that's the that's what I'm talking about. Queens, I mean, no, not Queensryche. Uh, they're another one. No, the reason I put Queensryche in the reason I confuse it, I'm actually talking about uh, uh oh, I, Dream Theater, but. Dream Theater, a bunch of Freemasons, too. Look at all their album covers. They got Freemason stuff all over fucking Square and Compass and shit. But they're they're the epitome of what I'm talking about. I mean, yeah, everybody in that band's a fucking, you know, can shred a million thousand notes per second, but you try to get them to give you a tune, at least with Rush, you know, you had people, you know, prof proficient musicianship and people playing a lot of notes, but there's always a song in there and a melody and what I, you know, you, know, you, you have to have a song. Can't just be a bunch of, and so that stuff gets really tiring to listen to. But I, I, I really only, it wasn't really from screaming, so I think it was more from talking. Just compounded and, you know, being tired and everything. Anyway, I've got a lot of stuff to talk about with you here. I've got some news to cover. I've got some different topics I want to talk about on a variety of different subjects. I'm going to do my best to give you as much as I can here while my voice isn't feeling good and intact and, and we're doing good right now. So I think I'm going to have start having a section of the show that's called what do you think about dot, 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 uh, because that's an email. It's a common email that I get. Just about every day I get at least, you know, a few of those. Hey, what do you think about dot, dot, dot? And so then I either end up, you know, either talking about on the show or writing them back or whatever, but I've gotten a lot of those lately. So I think we'll just start doing that. I'll just start having a, you know, we'll have news, we'll have whatever, but we'll have a set, a separate section. Maybe I should have like a little sound effect that comes in or something, or like a, you know, a little pre-tape thing that plays. I don't know. What do you think about this? Dot, dot, dot. All right. You know, I don't know. Anyway, uh, so I've got some of those. I got some other various topics and interesting stuff I want to mention and talk about here on the show. So strap in and get to that and get and uh, get ready for all that. Theglobalreality.com. Be sure to also add us on all our, our, our Facebook pages for social media. Um, really, where we post the most updates of the shows when they as soon as they go up and fundraising updates new stuff that's in the um, download shop, anything like that, all the new stuff that's going to, where well, you're going to find out about that first. The best way to keep up with that is to like us on Facebook, um, like us on both the 
Global Reality Radio Network, Facebook page, and the Josh Reeves Radio Host Filmmaker Explorer page as well. And also uh, Let There Be Rocks if you're interested in buying some crystals, minerals, um, jewelry, all kinds of stuff that we have. We've got a lot of stuff up there right now for sale. And uh, put a lot of stuff up not too long ago, but we haven't really had that many sales. We could use some sales right now. So if you want to support our work and you want to get some good crystals and some stuff for good, good stuff for investments as well, go and check out our Let There Be Rocks page. I had, um, where do I want to start? Okay. I didn't mention this a lot in the last show, but I, I had put this up uh, before the last show. And that one, I kind of put it up and didn't ever mention it, but it, it's pretty interesting video. If you haven't seen it already, it's on our YouTube channel. And it's entitled Peter, Peter Weller Drops Truth Bombs. And these are some uh, little clips that I, just little stuff I found. You know, I've, I've talked about that before. It, it's happened to me so many times, countless times, um, I can't even remember all of them. I talked about one not too long ago when, uh, about the Star Trek thing. William Shatner, that was another incident of that happening, but it's happened so many times. You wouldn't believe how many times I'm, I'm trying to unplug from thinking about this stuff for a minute, you know, and just get away from it. And something pops, another clue or something else pops up. It just, I mean, the, the synchronicity is just stupendous once you start getting on the path of really... Once you've, it, it's, I can't even describe this. It's, it's something that's happened to me consistently over the 10 years now that I've been on air and making films with this thing where once you get on the right track of something, the rest of the pieces sometimes just fall into place without much effort. Because once you start peeling back the onion, you know, you, the rest of it just, just sort of appears there. But sometimes I'm, that happens, I'll, you know, I'll just be watching something. So th these were little clips I had found just from watching stuff for Peter Weller, and interviews and stuff and talks at different events. And twice I found, because he's a, uh, Peter Weller is a, uh, be, you know, as well as being an actor and playing Robocop and Buckaroo Banzai, uh, I'm a huge Peter Weller fan. He's one of my just all-time favorite actors and heroes and everything. My, my dad took me to see Buckaroo Banzai at the theater when I was eight. It was great back then when I was a kid. It was different than even when, you know, like, say, my brothers and sisters were that age. Back then in the early 80s, like, I don't know. I guess it was because I was, at that time, I was I was young, and, you know, I didn't have brothers and sisters yet, quite, quite yet. Uh, they were going to be there very soon after that. But back in, back in those days, I remember my dad would just take me. And so I remember my aunt doing this. I would... I was a very interesting kid because I wanted to see, I don't know, I always wanted to see adult movies, I guess, you know. Um, and so my dad or my aunt or whoever would just, you know, take me to the movies and they would just let me pick <laughs> out of what was showing. And uh, I don't remember I ever picked anything too crazy, but there, there was a few examples that were just, you know, you look back on it and go, why would a fucking eight-year-old want to go see that? But I remember one of the, the wacky movies that I picked, and my dad, I remember my dad sometimes just being like, oh, God, you know. He'd always kind of groan about what I would pick, but then ultimately we would go and watch it, and then he would get into it. I remember that, I remember that happening quite a few times. Uh, Tron was one of them, the original Tron. Uh, I remember him just, you know, kind of being like, ah, whatever, before we went, and then, you know, he sees the movie and just, told, he, you know, he got him, so... I, I made him go see Buckaroo Banzai with me, and that was, it was a weird fucking movie anyway. But it's one of my favorites. That was the theme song to that was our opening music here for many, many years on the show. And that's what that is. It's a tribute to that. But Peter Weller is himself is a, uh, he's a historian, and he, I mean, the guy knows, he knows so much about history and ancient history, and, and I think, in my opinion, I think he probably knows more about obscure dynasties in Egypt than anybody I've ever heard. And you, you can hear him talk about this stuff sometimes. And he just, he knows all about it. But anyway, he was talking about, 
in one of these clips, I put two of these clips together. It's in the video on YouTube. Go check it out. Uh, Peter Weller drops truth bombs is the name of it. He he says he's talking about uh, shooting the shit with the people who made the movie The Exorcist and how the Hollywood bigwigs didn't want to put out the movie originally as it was with the scene, the Iraq, what he describes as the Iraq sequence. How this whole thing with the exorcist starts because they uncover this demon, ancient Mesopotamian, in, you know, in Iraq, named Pazuzu. And if you look up Pazuzu and stuff, I, mean, I remember us coming across that name. Remember back when I did the readings, I think, for Lost Book and Inky and some of those other Sitchin readings we did on the show, which, by the way, are all in individual files now. All 15 audiobooks I ever did on the show in the past 10 years, all available now for only $20 in the download shop. These are all new encodes, all individual files. It's only going to be 20 bucks till the uh, end of next month, so you should definitely go and get yourself one of those between now and next month because it's, I mean, you've got over 90, it's like 91 hours of audio. 15 audiobooks. Every one of them that I did is in there in its complete form, so you should definitely go and check that out. So he was talking about how basically, you know, the Hollywood people, oh, they don't want that. We don't want to mention a Pazuzu. We can't have that in there. And um, the reason that is, what's fascinating about that, you know, unless you have the context, you don't really know why that's a truth bomb, I guess. Um, other than, you know, it shows that they didn't want that in there. But the reason why they didn't want that in there has more to do with with going back, and this is something that uh, prior to the research I've done over the last 10 years, you're making all these films, this is a lot of stuff that I didn't know. And um, that's been the that's been the thing for me, man. I, I got into this 10 years ago thinking I knew a lot more than a lot of people because I you know knew about things that I never heard anybody talk about. So I was like, well, God, if I did a show, I could talk about these things I never hear anybody talking about, and I could have a show, you know. And uh, I blew my <laughs> total, utter, complete fucking load in the first month. Shit you not. First month. <laughs> Luckily, though, I had just found out about the Council for National Policy. So at that time, the CMP and was getting ready to, for that to be my second film. And um, that enabled me to... That finding that in you know enabled me to keep going and sustain me all the way through even now with the newest stuff that I'm doing with the spellcasters because it ties into that you know I had no idea that it would have tied into that so that's the thing is you know again I thought I I, I thought I knew something when I started knowing now I've learned more in the past ten years from making films and doing this radio show and stuff and just constantly because when you constantly have to have new material then there's you can't ever stop, you know. You can't ever stop uh, research. I, you know, I've, that's the thing is, I've never stopped researching. A lot of people research up to a point, and they're no longer researchers anymore. In fact, most people, most of these people out there that you hear that talk about these subjects, they quit researching years and years ago. They're just pontificating and, and regurgitating stuff. They've been repeating the same stuff they've been talking about for decades. In some cases, they're, they never bring anything new because they've stopped researching. And that's that's something I've never done. I've always kept the research going. And um, that one of the things that I've discovered in the course of that, especially during, it really started for me with the uh, with this the whole secret right stuff and trying to trace back the origins of power, the origins of control. How far back does this? you know, so-called conspiracy, go back. Where, you know, where do the, how far back into history, where does this originate from? It had to originate somewhere, right? So if we trace back where it originated from, we trace those tentacles all the way back from the modern day to, to back when it originated, then we're able to see across the whole precipice of it and get a greater understanding of who and really what it is we're up against. And, and then we start to be able to formulate what we can do to combat it. You know, the biggest thing about any of this stuff, everybody always, oh, we need solutions and solutions this and solutions that. And you can't have solutions to problems when you don't even know the whole totality 
of, of, of the scope of what you're actually dealing with. And everybody out there, most people are running around with this assumed idea of what it is. And I'm telling you from my own experience of researching this, you know, whatever explanations you think of Illuminati and this or that, or new world order, it, I, I'm telling you, it's really a simplified explanation for something that, um, has always been there. You know, it's just, it's very different names and, and different affiliations and things through the years, but it all traces back originally to the same source. And, um, you know, finding out that, as I talk about in my Lost Secrets of Ancient America series, you know, looking at the, um, well, the whole origins of, like, Judaism, you know, and, and we talk about the Amorites and the Giants and in that film, Lost Secrets of Ancient America, and, um, you know, the whole thing with Judaism being based on, it's based on the Talmud. Everybody knows about the Talmud, but nobody ever, I always wonder why nobody ever talks about the fact that the Talmud was not originally original work. When, when they came in and took over here, see here, my voice is starting to go, something starting to sound like Marty McFly. You hear that? Ah, geez, I don't know, doc. It's heavy. I don't know why when my, <laughs> my voice goes out, it starts to sound like Marty McFly. I don't know why it is. That's heavy doc. I don't know. You mean I can't go back to 1985? <laughs> I don't know what it is. Uh, it's like I can only do a, a fucking Marty McFly impersonation when my voice is starting to go. Um, so when they came in and, and wiped out the Amorites and took everything over in that part of the world, lock, stock, and barrel, they absorbed everything um, from that previous culture into their own, and these things later became Judaism, but they were taken from much older texts. In fact, the actual Talmud is short for its original title, which is the Babylonian Talmud, which goes back to the worship of, of Baal and uh, Pazuzu was one, all these different demonic entities. It goes back to the Anunnaki stuff, Anunnaki and Sumerian, Babylonian, Akkadian, goes back to that, to, to all of that information. And so for them with the exorcist to put that in there about Pazuzu, Maybe not so much at the time, but they knew probably that, you know, down the road there was going to come a time where people would start connecting the dots on that. And, I mean, as we've talked about with the connections, as I show in Spellcasters Volume 1, the connections with, you know, the the big fat cats that run Hollywood and Jewish connections there. I mean, of course, they don't want people finding out that this thing, the exorcist, that appears on its surface to be you know, only connected to Catholicism and whatnot, actually traces its roots back to pre-Judaism and the worship of, of, of demonic entities, thereby showing that Judaism itself is based on the worship of demonic entities, and even to this day. So the, the, the big fat fucking fat cats at the Hollywood studios were not having that with the uh, original extras. They didn't want that in there. Anyway, it's, it's just fascinating, you know, it, just to see somebody like Peter Weller bring that up and talk about that. And somebody, you know, he, he, he heard this discussion firsthand from the guy that directed the movie. So that's pretty killer. And then, of course, his, his other, the other video uh, is him talking. It's uh, actually a uh, what that's from because you'll see John Lithgow there because John Lithgow was also in uh, Buckaroo Banzai. And he talks about the guy, I think it's, it might have been, I don't know if it was W.D. Richter or the guy that, I am a W.D. Richter, I couldn't remember if it was him or the guy that wrote the uh, story, Buckaroo Banzai. There is an interesting connection. I don't know if, you, if you've ever seen Buckaroo Banzai and you're a fan of that movie, uh, like I am, I'll tell you an interesting thing. You know, because a lot of people are always, well, I don't get it, I don't understand. I've even heard Peter, Peter Weller talk about it. I still don't know what that movie was about. I always knew what it was about, and that's why I liked it. You know, in the pre-internet days, and the pre-olden days, even before they had comic book shops, if you were into comic books, right, and I got into comic books when I was a little kid, well, if you had a series like Daredevil or fucking Batman or whoever it is, you know, even Fantastic Four or something at that time, by the time I was a kid in the 80s, they'd been making fucking comic books for 20-something years, right? 30-something years, you know, my dad had those, that, those shits when he was a kid. 
So if you went into like, a, you know, a grocery store or a bookstore or something, you got just a, a random issue off the shelf of a, any, you know, pick a comic book name, Spider-Man, whatever it might be. Well, you, well, you were getting the issue like what? Issue 458 of, you know, however many before that, right? So if you just got one issue, if you didn't know anything about the backstory of the characters, if you didn't know anything about anything else, all the information you had to go on for those sto- for those characters or that story or anything else is contained in that one issue. That's all you have. So you either have to go back and try to, you know, it was a lot harder back in those days to find back issues and stuff than it is now. So you either had to go and find back issues or, you know, find out ways to see what else was going on in the story. But all you had to operate on sometimes when you're reading is just that one issue. But what was great is if it was a good issue, then you could, you, it would work. You could have just one issue of a comic book, and, and even if you didn't have any other ones, you could still have a good story, a good be- beginning, middle, any whatever, and you could get enjoyment out of it. And that's what uh, Buckaroo Banzai is. It's one issue of a comic book that doesn't exist, even though now, of course, they've made tons of Buckaroo Banzai comic books afterwards. And there were a few ones, there were like two Marvel ones that were based on uh, the movie when they fir- when it first came out, which I had as a kid. But um, at, at the time before the movie was made, it wasn't like now where they were making this movie based on a comic book series. This was a non-existent thing that the writer just came up with. And at the end of the movie, and the way you, you know this is throughout the movie, they make references to their, to a Buckaroo Banzai comic book. There's about three or four times in the movie where they kind of subtly reference, oh, just like in the comic book, or, oh, hey, I saw you in the comic book, and there's another scene where one of the kids is reading a Buckaroo Banzai comic book. So they kind of reinforce that. And that's interesting, because that movie came out in 1984, so this is long before, you know, comic book movies or any of that stuff was being made. So it's really like one issue of, of a comic book series. And at the very end, it says, um, coming soon, more Buckaroo Banzai, Buckaroo Banzai against the World Crime League. And of course, it, you know, it never got made, never came out. There were never any more. But this is another interesting thing I found out. And if you're a fan of either one of these movies or both of these movies, this will really twist your noodle. Um, watch Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension. Watch that movie. You've never seen it. And even if you've seen the, the movie I'm about to say, watch it again anyway. Right after you watch Buckaroo Banzai. Right after you watch Buckaroo Banzai, watch the movie Big Trouble in Little China with Kurt Russell. Watch those movies back to back and you'll have your mind blown. You know why? This is crazy. It's honest got truth, though. You can look it up. Um, the guy who wrote Big Trouble in Little China also wrote Buckaroo Banzai. And so originally his script for the sequel uh, uh, against the World Crime League was rewritten as Big Trouble in Little China. So when you watch, it's nuts. When you watch, so if you watch uh, Buck Rubansa and then watch um, Big Trouble in Little China, you can see obviously where they changed, you know, a lot of the stuff. But you can see, you know, Kurt Russell's character, you know, being very close to Buck Rubansa and you can really tell, oh shit, it, that was that movie is essentially the sequel to Buckaroo Banzai. Even it's just changed and different characters, different names. But when you watch those two movies back to back, you're actually watching part one and part two, and not very many people know that. But um, Peter Weller was talking about when he was, and I've seen him talk about this in several occasions. He was talking when they were making Buckaroo Banzai that there were all these these weird like big time banker and financial people showing up and uh, just coming to the set and watching everything. And that um, the company that made the movie, which went defunct shortly afterwards, uh, had its money supplied to them by the Hunt brothers. And that this company made three movies they made, which is funny because these, I remember watching all three of these movies with my family as a kid, Buckaroo Banzai, Mr. Mom, and War Games with Matthew Broderick. Those three movies. Buck Rubansai, War Games, and Mr. Mom were all three made by this company that made um, those three movies that was funded, had its seed money provided to them by the Hunt Brothers. Now, when you see what I've already talked about in relation to the Spellcasters, Volume 1, you see what I've already discussed there with the connections with uh, the CMP, Hollywood, the Truth Movement, MKUltra, that whole thing. 
and you understand that the Hunt brothers were also implicated in, in the assassination of John F. Kennedy here in Dallas, and then you also tie in the fact that they provided, the Hunt brothers provided the money, the startup money for the Council for National Policy to Tim LaHaye, Reverend Tim LaHaye, that they provided the seed money for that, and they provided the seed money. So being right there, we have a connection that, you know, not just a loose connection, that really ties all my work up for the last 10 years. Uh, it's just incredible, you know, to get that kind of confirmation like that from, from an actor. And, you know, I can tell just from hearing him talk about it, he doesn't really know. Um, I don't think he really knows the implications of that. But he does make a statement in there where he says something about, the powers that be had to had to watch with this guy around because he would just say anything to anybody. And he doesn't, Peter Will doesn't give any, it's in that clip, he doesn't really give any context for that. But I listened to that a few times when I was making the video and I went, that sounds like he's talking about, like he's confirming that this guy um, was CIA connections because, of course, the Hunt brothers had CIA connections. The CMP was, a, you know, a, a CIA front group. So I guess apparently this guy that made Buckaroo Banzai had, because he said something about, you know, him, him, he would just say anything to anybody, and the powers that be had to watch it when he was around. I just thought that was an odd statement to make. So, yeah, fascinating stuff there. And I uh, wanted to talk about that since I had posted that video and not really talked about it, giving any context. It's just amazing sometimes what you find when you're not even looking for it. You know, and that's what I'm talking about, man. That's why you always have to have your antenna up from this stuff. You're going to find the truth sometimes in places you didn't even know you even think you would find it. It's a fact. I can attest to it, man. It's happened to me many times. All right, it's time to do our new segment here. What do you think about? Dot, dot, dot. All right. Let's see here. What do you think about? Oh, I hadn't talked about this. I forgot I hadn't talked about it. Uh, what do you think about? The death of Jim Mars. Yeah, well, I didn't talk about the death of Jim Mars. Uh, I actually knew it was coming. I'd heard a few months ago, actually. I'd heard he went blind, uh, diabetes. He was on kidney dialysis. So even though the official cause of death was a heart attack or whatever, it was caused by diabetes. I, you know, um, yeah, I guess I guess it's it just didn't even cross my mind to talk about it on the last show. To be honest with you. I didn't, I didn't remember and for, kind of forgot about it. I've been busy working on the film. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else I can say. If you've seen the Spellcasters 1 and, and, and also 1.5, yeah, it's pretty clear. Um, you know, he's, he was another one of those guys that fooled a lot of people. And uh, sadly, his legacy is forever tainted by the fact that he spent the dwindling years of his life promoting fucking... Battleship Earth, L. Ron Hubbard on, across multiple radio stations and on TV, and I mean, it's just insane. And sit there and claim, even though he's been the guest of honor at, at many of these Scientology functions that he has no association with, because people were not expecting us to uncover, not expecting me to uncover anyway, the whole Free Zone thing. With Free Zone Scientology, which I talk about in Spellcasters 1.5, so if you haven't seen Volume 1, you need to go get it in the download shop now, and after you're done there, get Volume 1.5 too, because this is not just a throwaway little film. It's actually vital information that will help you better understand and help make the case for what I present in Volume 1. Um, since Volume 2 is going to be such a different film, it didn't couldn't really fit there. Um, as I've talked about many times, I mean, Jim Mars, you know, in the early days of, of me getting into this stuff, <clears throat> Well, his book Crossfire specifically, that was um that was really my gateway. I'd already been into UFOs and Bermuda Triangle and aliens and all that stuff before that. But inexplicably the little podunk ass high school I went to out in the middle of nowhere, about an hour outside of Dallas out in the country, uh, when I lived with my grandparents, uh inexplicably in the early nineties, a few years I guess after the book was published. They had that book in, in, in that library, and it was so weird, the books I would find in this library. I remember there was a David Bowie biography in there, which is also a weird thing for this little, you know, kind of Bible belty school there. I fucking did a book report on that goddamn 
I must have done a book report of that goddamn Bowie book. I mean, like eight or nine, ten times throughout my fucking high school. Nobody ever fucking caught on. Nobody ever noticed that. I'll just do it over. Just do the same one. Nobody ever noticed. And uh, one of the books they had in there that I did a book report on one year was uh, was Crossfire. And I just remember getting that and reading it going, I can't fucking believe this is in, you know, in the high school library. I just couldn't believe it. Um, and as I've talked about many times, you know, I didn't even, I never really heard anything about the Kennedy assassination or really knew anything about it until I was about 13, 14, 15 years old, something like that. Even though I grew, grew up around, you know, lived in Dallas, my grandparents and on both sides, you know, lived here. And my parents went to high school. Both parents went to high school in Dallas proper. Um, you know, it was just, it just wasn't something people talked about. And I heard Jim Mars talk about that one time. He said, you know, which is, he, he, he really made me understand. He was like, well, he's because he didn't think that was so shocking because he's like, no, it was not polite to talk about it for many years. It was not even polite in Dallas. It was not people in Dallas, you know, people from my grandparents generation and even my parents generation. It was just not something people talked about in polite society or even brought up or mentioned. So when I first heard about it, I was, I was, that was my biggest question. Why how come nobody's ever talks about this? How come I've never, I mean, shit, this is big historic stuff. We should be talking about this. I, I, I shouldn't be as old as I am and not, and only hearing about this now, you know, like it's been shielded from me or something. I mean, it was really, I remember even before I knew anything really about a conspiracy, I was already feeling conspiratorial about it because I already felt like people had conspired to, for me to not hear about this. And I remember asking my grandmother and, and she just po- po- very calmly <laughs> said, Oh, come here. And she, and I went in her room in her bedroom and she pulls out this fucking safety deposit box and unlocks it. And it's in plastic, dude. She had this in plastic newspaper from the day, right? Dallas morning news, Dallas times Herald, one of those. And, um, She's had the foresight to save this, and I, you know, she pulled it out and let me check it out. So I'm like reading it and going through it, and already I was I was seeing stuff in this newspaper, you know, that was reported on the day. And you see this, we saw this echoed again. This is how I knew when 9/11 happens. I I, I knew that 9/11 was another Kennedy because we had all these, you know, they were saying that the remember they said Congress, there was a bomb at Congress and. uh and that Israel got nuked. I mean, there was all this fucking counter stuff coming out that later was not to be true, but it was put out and announced on the news. And stuff just doesn't get to that stage. I mean, people for people that can't wrap their minds around it, they just write it off as just a, a simple mistake. Nothing can get to <laughs> nothing can get to broadcast news like that without somebody having an intent behind it and it being put out there. Those weren't just little accidents. Well, it's funny. I was seeing that kind of stuff in the Kennedy thing. That was my first, you know, I was like, wait a minute here. This conflicts. Stuff about, like, the trade, the, or stuff about the, the route to, of the parade and just different things. I was just finding discrepancies. So then I read that Crossfire book, you know, and it really got me on fire about it. And I swear it was like, because I was living with my grandparents at the time in, um, by choice, and I remember... I don't remember exactly how long, but it was a short period of time after that. I went to my dad's for the weekend, and I would go on like a Friday night and go, and go back to my grandparents on like Sunday, right? So, you know, on Friday nights or whatever, you remember those days. You remember the, you remember the fucking movie, movie store fucking night. You know, you go to the movies and you'd rent two or three movies or whatever for the weekend or three or four. And one of the ones that, that, they had already gone to the video store before I got there and made some selections for the weekend. And one of the ones that they had was, uh, was JFK. So I remember watching that and I just read the book and a lot of the movie was based on that. And it really, it really set me on fire. It really like made me like, you know, fuck, I'm going to, I'm going to find out something about this, but I, you know, going through high school and, you know, then you start getting into, into chicks and you start getting into music and playing guitar like I did. So, you know, um, I got to be honest, a lot of that stuff, <laughs> a lot of that stuff took a back seat for a while, uh, and, uh, pussy and, and beer and, and rock music took the fucking front seat for, uh, an extended amount of time. 
to which I later started going back to because I started getting into, you know, the the free your mind end of the, of things, you know, as as a teenager, you know, the mind expansion, consciousness expansion level and psychedelics and all that stuff. So uh, that ultimately led to, you know, the looking at the spiritual side of things, which then led me back towards the aliens and the Freemasons and conspiracy stuff again. So it's been, you know, I've, I've been on this arc really uh, my whole life of uncovering and, and looking at all this stuff. And, and uh, you know, I've talked about all those experiences that I had out around Rockwall as a teenager and other stuff that other people I knew had experienced around that area too. Just, you know, weird missing time stuff, UFO sightings, strange energy vortex things, just weird stuff. And then, you know, in 2003 or whatever, 2002, no, 2002, I think it was. 2002, 2003, somewhere in there. Reading, you know, reading Jim Mars' book, Rule by Secrecy. And, you know, there at the end of that chapter saying, you know, maybe one day we'll have answers for all the different mysteries, this, that, and the other, and the ancient rock wall in Rockwall, Texas. And I just went, oh, my God. There it is, you know. And, uh, yeah, I met Jim Mars many times and, uh, and there's, I don't know, there's weird discrepancies, man. I don't know. He, 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 he met me at least seven or eight times and every time he'd act like he never, he never even heard. I interviewed him twice, interviewed him twice, met him seven or eight times. I had him at multiple events. We had him at a nine 11 truth thing one time. He'd always act like he didn't even, like he never remembered me, didn't know who I was, didn't know my name, whatever. Really always acted like, to me, like somebody clearly under mind control. It really almost seemed like a robot. But I had some discrepancies. I, I, I can tell you, it said when he died, it said that he was 74. He must have been lying about his age. I always thought there were some some discrepancies there with, with his age. Because I remember him telling me he was 72, like 10 years ago, maybe more, maybe, 2006 maybe, 2007. We had a uh, we showed loose change this nine eleven group I was in in Dallas and and he came out and gave a little speech after the movie and whatnot. And I remember even then my sister asked him I used to have it on video but it was on an old hard drive that got lost but she did I used to have it on video she did ask him about the rock wall even at that thing. Um, but I remember him telling me that, that I was asking him you know one time I think it was about t- two thousand seven or so I remember him telling me I said how old are you now Jim you know being seventy two or whatever. So I thought he was should have been released 84 when he died, and he said he was 74. You know, there was another thing where he also said that he was um, a reporter for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram in 1963 when Kennedy was assassinated, but that doesn't jive. He would have only been like 20. Where did, where did he find time to be in the military and and go to college and be in the military and be a reporter for the Fort Worth Star Telegram in, in in 1964. I mean, just stuff just didn't add up. But um, yeah, you know, I, again, I don't really have much to say other than the fact that you know I got fooled too. Uh, but as you see in my spellcasters, volume one and one point five, um, you know, it's pretty clear. Yet another Scientology. So I'll tell you when I first really knew Jim Mars, it was actually one of the times I interviewed him. I'll tell you when I had when I first started having my doubts, when I first was like, oh shit, he's connected to the dirty stuff. I interviewed him and we were talking about chemtrails, and I said, um, I remember what I said about chemtrails, and he said, Well, you know, I, I got a friend who works in uh black ops for the CIA, and just just that statement. And just the arrogance of that statement, and I know that a lot of people out there are dumb, and they're not educated about this stuff, and it's not their fault, and, and, and you know, a statement like that goes over their head. Listen, anytime anybody makes a statement, folks, you want to talk about somebody you can immediately say you should not trust, anybody that makes a statement that says, yeah, my friend that works in black ops, 
my friend that works in black, listen, your friend that works in black ops is not going to be telling you anything about anything unless you also have a security clearance like he does. But they bank on you being idiotic and you not knowing this, folks. Okay, this is how these people operate and pray. And whether it's Jim Mars or whoever it is, this is the stuff you got to be aware of. And it wasn't even that the info, I thought the info he was giving me was bad. It was just that his, you know, his admitted source was somebody that works in CIA black ops. And of course, you know, I'm sitting there going, well, even if it sounds believable, you shouldn't, you shouldn't believe it 100% because if it's coming from CIA black ops, it's probably disinfo. But I found that what he said to be true. And he said that his friend told him that they spray that chaff, which is that white filament powder. So it looks like, um, you'll see it, man. It looks like cobwebs falling out of the sky or spider webs falling out of the sky, long stringy white stuff. Um, because according to his, to Jim Mars CIA black ops friend, uh, they don't actually spray anything up there in, in chemtrails. It's not actually chemicals that are spraying. It's this shaft that comes through the la- a layer of the atmosphere where, of course, all this stuff that floats up from the ground level up and just sits up there in a layer of the atmosphere um, that we can't, you know, it doesn't harm us because it's so far up in the, in the stratosphere, but it doesn't affect us. But when you spray this chaff, this filament powder, it's able to uh, absorb whatever it goes through and then it comes down to the ground level we breathe it in and because of the shaft it, it enables this stuff to break the blood brain barrier which means it goes right into your system so according to Jim Mars and it, this is really has made the most sense to me as far as the chemtrail stuff that I've ever heard but uh, again how do we know whether to believe it or to not believe it considering you know the, the alleged source it came from I have a tendency to think that um Nobody's going to tell anybody anything of any truth unless that person also has you know, a high-level security clearance. So, anyway, there's that. What else? What do you think about the tearing down the Civil War statues? Um, uh, really? I, uh, I, you know. I'm not, you know, I'm not against it. Because it gives a shit. But here's what I, okay, well, let, let me put it to you like this. Here's, here's where, here's my opinion on it. Um, most of these things, most of these Civil War statues, in fact, were, you know, they were not, most of these were not uh, erected right after the Civil War. Anyway, they were later erected during like the Jim Crow era and, you know, all that shit. So, you know, here, here's my thing. If somebody, if somebody votes for it, somebody votes to have these things taken down, okay, fine. But, I mean, I don't see any uh, democratic process going on here. I mean, I think there has been some cases where somebody's voted for these things to be removed, but there are people who have just been tearing these things down. Um, that doesn't sound like democracy to me. I thought we were supposed to vote on these things, and if a majority agree to, to, you know, to take action on something, then it happens. Well, this is not democracy. I mean, this is mob rule. This is, I, I mean, th- this is absolute anarchy. And hey, if, if that's the way we're going, then let's go. You know what I'm saying? I mean, l- fuck it, let's go. But this, this shit where, I mean, I don't know. I, d- I don't think, if, if all the people that have been knocking these down and they've been knocking down ones that haven't been voted on or agreed to be taken down, and they're it's vandalism or whatever. Um, and I think every one of these people who have brought these things down should be prosecuted to the fullest extent, and any in the same manner that anybody that tears down any statue should be. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter if if you can say that maybe the reasons for them destructing or tearing down is justified. That that may all well be well and fine. Doesn't matter what you believe one way or the other as far as that's concerned. But if these people are committing crimes and getting away with it because it's a Confederate statue when a guy that goes and tears down a fucking, you know, Martin Luther King statue or something gets thrown under the jail. You see what I'm saying? And that's the other thing. What are we replacing? What are we going to replace these things with? 
Because if we're talking about replacing these things with statues of known admitted Marxists or something of that nature, okay, then I start to have a problem with that's that's the whole thing with all this. Um if something is and I'll tell you another thing I don't agree with the whole the whole six flags thing, that really pissed me off. Um, you know, six flags Six Flags, especially Six Flags here in, in Dallas, Six Flags over Texas in Arlington. I mean, that was the original, you know, that was the very first ever theme park. Numero uno, very first ever theme park anywhere. In fact, Walt Disney came here to Dallas, to Arlington, to the original Six Flags. And many of the ideas that he later incorporated into his theme parks were taken originally from that one. I've done a lot of research into Six Flags. Man, I have a, I have a personal history that goes along with it too. So I know a lot about the about that. And that was the whole original theme of it was six flags, six different flags that have flown over over Texas and its history. And each theme, each area of the park would be a different theme relating to those six flags. Right? And so one of them happened to be the Confederate flag. They decided, to, and they've always flown since day one of that, that thing opened in the early 60s. All six flags have flown outside of it, and uh, this, they took the Confederate one down because it's a symbol of hate. Now, I mean, this is the kind of stuff where I'm like, okay, look, this is just getting out of control. Um, we're talking about, I mean, historically, six flags did fly over it. it. You know, it's not, that doesn't change. Just because something's been used as a symbol of hate, allegedly, doesn't mean that 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 history's changed. All of a sudden, we don't acknowledge the fact that six flags flew over fucking Texas, and that the name of this theme park came from that. I mean, it's ridiculous. That's the shit I'm talking about. And again, the, the whole thing of 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 there not being a vote or nobody deciding whether or not this is okay, just people doing it. Those people should be prosecuted like criminals and, and to the full extent. And I think a lot of them probably aren't. I don't think many of them are. But, again, if they aren't, it just goes to show you, again, the further. I mean, again, we're, we should have total anarchy. Pretty much, I mean, why not? The people that make the laws and the people that, you know, govern and, I mean, these people don't follow laws. They're the biggest criminals. They wouldn't get there if they weren't fucking criminals. Yet we're supposed to be the ones that follow all the rules. No. So, again, you know, clearly... These hypocrites don't have any under any kind of care for law, so it would be clear that they would want. But again, it's you know it's just a further divide thing. I don't really give one fuck or two shits if they tear them all down, as far as I'm concerned. But I think if you're going to do stuff like that, you know there should be at least a semblance of democracy in it. There should still be votes. You know, this thing, I mean, if we're just going to start tearing down stuff willy-nilly, I mean, we're, that's the slippery slope towards total anarchy. And again, if that's if that's what we're going to, let's do it. Fuck it. Maybe it'll work better than what, what, what we've had now. But, again, it's always this little half-ass shit that people do. Um, but I know most of you don't buy into all this stuff. You know what it is. I've talked about it a million times. All this stuff is just about the further homogenization of mankind and taking away all individuality that's what the whole thing's about no matter what agenda they are really the whole thing is they this is why they've i mean why do you think hollywood just continues to remake stuff and and any sort of new ideas are not even considered anymore why do you think music labels 20 years ago started signing nothing but shit And right around the same time, clubs started en enacting no smoking laws, which made people not go out and see live music anymore. This is this whole conspiracy is all about stripping away of individuality and making everybody. I mean, that's what all the you know the transgenderism stuff they're pushing it is. It's about creating a homogenized society where everybody is of one religion, one belief. There are no questions. You don't question the state. You don't question science. You don't question religion. Everything is explained. Everybody is one. That's what the whole idea of one world is. Because the biggest threat to tyranny is individuality. And the expression of the free spirit and the individuality of that person to express themselves unhindered 
in a positive and creative way in order to make the world a better, and, or even at least their little area they live in a better place. But that's the biggest threat to tyranny, man. That's why they want to do away. That's what all this ISIS and all this stuff and funding this and holy wars, it's all about getting everybody to buy into a homogenized society. And it's why they've been trying to associate ass hat CIA assets like Alex Jones and others with grassroots efforts to really find truth about everything. And that's why I'm glad me and all of you out there and all my listeners have separated ourselves and aren't a part of all that ass hattery. I'm not on the Alex Jones right wing. I've been I'm glad I've been exposing that shit for here for ten years. That's not me, and I've got a history of 10 years of radio and films and everything else exposing that, so y'all aren't getting me associated get with that horse shit. I made it clear I saw this coming a long time ago and knew who was leading the fucking charge to bring it in even before anybody else was talking about it. That's a fact. Uh, how much did you hear me talk about the eclipse beforehand? None. Didn't even fucking bring it up, did I? <laughs> yeah, I mean, just when you see that many people, folks, you, imagine you see how many people, how people reacted about this fucking eclipse. Imagine if you get somebody, if you get that many people to react to something political or to a, a, a candidate or to, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> Let's get everybody to go nuts fucking crazy to go out and drive out and get in traffic jams and all this horse shit. And get everybody to stare at the fucking sun. Willingly. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I had people ask me about it. I didn't really, I didn't have some emails. I'm sorry I didn't answer your emails. I've been busy. What do you think about this eclipse thing? Well, again, I don't know. I just don't trust anything where everybody's this whole kid let's go out and stare at the sun um and turns out of course i was right there are tons of people today reporting massive headaches even uh, again even if you have whatever special glass you, you shouldn't be staring at the sun there's a reason why they tell you not to do that i didn't get fuck one about it i didn't even I, I saw that it got i saw that it got dark in the house for about 20 minutes kind of dark i was like oh must be that eclipse. Mm, okay, great. Next. So you look directly at the sun while trying to, uh, to to watch the solar eclipse. Maybe you didn't read the warnings or couldn't get your hands on a pair of eclipse glasses. But even if you did, uh, you can still do damage to your eyes. Short-term issues can include solar keratitis, which is similar to sunburn of the cornea, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, tons of people have, and I, I don't know. I just thought about that and was like, eh. Something doesn't seem right about it. And, of course, they were billing, once in a lifetime. All the media was saying, once in a lifetime. Like, you asshats, this happened again in 2024. I swear they say they only happen every so often. I swear there's been five or six since I've been alive. I'm not kidding you. I remember seeing one when I was like seven or eight. I was on the way with my stepmom. She was taking me to a doctor's appointment, and we stopped at this little gas station where we used to live, and we were getting gas or something, and the guy, it was like a tire shop, you know? And the guy was said, hey, you want to see the eclipse? You guys want to see it? And he brought this welder's mask out, and we put the welder's mask on, and we looked at the, and saw the eclipse, and I remember, I remember them saying, oh, there won't be another one of these till I was like eight or something. I remember saying, oh, you'll be 71 years old or something when there's another one of these. And I swear to God, there's been five or six. There's one like every few years. They're like, this is once in a lifetime. You won't see this again for another 80 years. And then four or five years go by and there's another one. Anybody else but me notice that? <laughs> Did you guys, the, the fucking craziest thing I saw was that they had some moon fest thing or something somewhere. I think it was in, it was in Southern Illinois, very close to uh, Cahokia, actually, which is very interesting. They had a big concert in right as it was like a three day music festival, and right as it was reaching totality, they had timed it so that Ozzy Osbourne would go on stage and play 
the song Bark at the Moon right as the eclipse was reaching its totality. You can see the video on YouTube is fucking nuts. But, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. To me, it always goes back. People, well, why would they do this? Why would they get everybody to blah, blah, blah? Well, I mean, think about it. Look at all the... Have you ever been on a road trip before? Next time you go on a road trip, Make names, make note of all the gas stations that you see, okay? All the different names of them. And then go look at who owns those. Look up on your phone or whatever. Look up who owns those those companies, man. Those big oil companies own all those gas stations and they own all the, you know, they get a cut of everything that's sold on the snacks. It's, it's you know, millions, billions of dollars. Just like they... Make money off of disasters. People wonder, I've talked about that years ago, the disaster economy. And, you know, using weather weapons and whatnot to create disasters because then the companies that get the contracts to rebuild are all like Halliburton and all the big uh, companies that the powers that be own. It's the same old, same old thing. And, uh, again, the answer to 99 out of 100 questions is usually always money, isn't it? Have you guys heard about this thing going on with the band Journey? I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, I guess apparently there's been some friction going on in that band for the past couple of years. Um, they, I think for the past ten years they've been they had this you know this guy this Filipino singer that kind of sounds like Steve Perry and they've been doing really well. They got the original or not the original drummer, but I guess the drummer from the like the main era Steve Perry or uh, Steve Smith. He's a great drummer. Up there with Neil Peart, as far as, you know, fantastic drummers. He used to have Ansley Dunn's bar, but um, anyway, it's a fascinating story. I heard a little bit about this, and it was even more fascinating once I dug into it. I, I wanted to see what the problem was. Um, one of the guys in the band, Jonathan Kane, the, the keyboardist um, who co-wrote some of the classic songs from the Steve, Steve Perry era, and they were recently inducted into the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year. Um, three of the guys from the current lineup of Journey, including Arnel Pineda, the singer, and uh, the keyboardist, songwriter Jonathan Kane, and the bass player as well, um, made a trip to... The White House, Ross Valerie, who was the bass player's name. And um, and made a visit to, to, to Donald Trump. Now, what's interesting about this is that, uh, the, the, of course, the media picks up this whole journey, goes to the White House or whatever, but, see, Neil Sean has always, he's always made a point not to have any kind of politics left, right, or any kind with, you know, didn't ever want that associated with, with the band at all. And it's his band. He owns it. He owns the name. He owns everything. And, uh, yeah. Uh, he's pretty fucking pissed about it. Um, this is Neil Sean has mostly tried to stay out of politics using time off for personal pursuits. They don't include running for office. Journey did play the Republican National Convention in 2012, but declined to perform at last year's gathering, which had a decidedly different tenor. That's by design, as Sean told the Tennessean in 2016, that Journey is a, quote, feel-good band that's all about hope, joy, love, and good things in life, and not, say, executive orders that ban people based on religion or country of origin. As it turns out, though, Sean has been flying solo in those endeavors as his bandmates are Nell Pineda, Keyboards Jonathan Kane and bassist Ross Valerie are apparently willing to hitch a ride aboard the Trump train. Kane, Pineda, and Valerie all visited the White House last week, and for that, Sean put them on blast on Facebook. Uh, I will remain strong and consistent with the belief we've always shared and agreed upon. Journey should never be used and exploited by anyone, especially band members, for politics or any one religion. I've been here since 1972, and this has always been our belief. This was with intent to exploit the brand and use the name Journey. Journey was not there. Three members from uh, Journey were there. 
uh, tours are done all the time, but it could have been done privately. So I guess his problem with what was nobody nobody said anything, even though he's the leader of the band. I don't no one ever, no one discussed it with him. They just did it and didn't tell him they were going to go do it. Now here's where it gets interesting. Because at first, on the face of it, it just doesn't seem like, okay, you know, this is just somebody fighting about politics. Now, here's where it gets interesting. And this is where I see Neil Sean's point on this. It says, Sean takes exception with headlines in reference to Journey being in Washington, D.C. to meet with Trump, writing that without his presence, the band itself was not there. It seems less of a dig at the other members' bona fides and more of a distinction that Kane, Panetta, and Valerie attended a private, as private non-journey citizens. Or maybe not, because he follows up with, quote, this clearly knows, shows no respect or unity, just divide. Sean writes that all the other guys, quote, know my position and the way we've always been until now, which was in accordance that music we make is for everyone. Sean and Kane have been fighting over wading into political waters for a while now, I'll tell you what, Jonathan Cain is a big douchebag. I've seen him in interviews. He comes off as just a big, smug, holier than... You know, some of those people, when they when they go Christian, they just go t- become totally smug and holier than thou, and I'm better than you. I mean, when you see somebody in interviews just exude that, you know, you, you got to imagine you're really dealing with a fucking mainline fucking D-bag, you know? Um, but here's where it gets interesting. The keyboardist has a solo, quote-unquote, faith music career that probably suits his wife, Paula White Kane. That's funny. Her name was Paula White, and his last name's Kane. Paula White Kane. Yeah, you know, probably doing some... I know Journey was doing some White Kane in the 80s. Uh, just fine, as she is, after all the president's spiritual advisor. And um, now I'm not seeing it in this article. That's weird. Give me just a second here. This was the main thing I was keying in on. Now I don't see it. There it is. Yeah, this was in the comments uh, from the, the, the original Facebook post that Neil Sean made about all this. And he says, this was our rule up until two years ago. There was clearly another agenda I could plainly see happening that far back. Nobody is going to hijack Journey from me, no one. And that's when it clicked with me and I went, shit. You know, because I've already been looking at all this CMP stuff and the the CIA stuff, and now especially with Spellcaster 2, the connections with the music stuff. And that clicked with me, where he said, nobody's going to hijack Journey from me. And I thought, well, why would somebody, you know, how would that, how would this thing have the ability to hijack Journey from him? Well, then I started looking into Paula White, Paula White Kane. Jonathan Kane's wife. She uh, Paula Michelle White Kane. Is a Pentecostal Christian televangelist. She is the senior pastor of New Destiny Christian Center in Apopka, Florida, near Orlando, a non-denominational multicultural megachurch. She hosts a television show, Paula White Today. She was the co-pastor of. Without Walls International Church in Tampa, a church she co-founded with pastor and then-husband Randy White. White was named to the chair the the Evangelical Advisory Board in Donald Trump's administration. She is the spiritual advisor to Donald Trump. I started doing some digging. Sure enough, guess what? She's a Council for National Policy member. So Jonathan Cain, the guitarist from Journey, you you thought fucking you thought Neil Sean put you on blast? I'm putting you on blast on blast even more here, son. This motherfucker's married. We clearly see who owns the fucking wears the fucking pants in that family. He's married to an evangelical preacher, Council for National Policy member. 
And though, even though it didn't say any of this stuff in that, in any of the articles about all this, I kept saying, well, what's the problem here? I don't get it. I mean, I understand people have different political things, but to take three members of a five member band and say that's journey without the leader, even asking the leader of the band, the guy that owns the name and who's essentially your boss. I mean, just something that seemed weird about that, you know? Like, intentionally asking for trouble, and then to see his comment about, oh, you're not going to hijack this band for me, that's when I started to see what's really going on. So, this is fascinating. This is going to be interesting. Um, I don't know, man. If uh, All I can say is, if... Uh, if Neil Sean just decides to hang himself sometime soon, I'm going to fucking lose my goddamn mind. That's all I can say. Because uh, I don't think he's the type of guy that would do that. But if, you, if all of a sudden, you know, you hear of this, because I'm telling you, man, that's where the, most of these mind control assassins and stuff, it's always related to these secretive groups that have to do with the CMP and these other right. It's just insane. So, yeah, that was another one of those cases, man, of, you know, finding truth where you didn't expect to find it there. So it's going to be interesting to see how this how this all plays out. Well, uh, as I've talked about, I'm continuing to try and finish uh, Spellcasters Volume 2, and um, i got to be honest with you, I've just gone as far as I can go now um without having you know funding to keep continuing and that's <laughs> i mean we we we've already gone through t the most of this month we've only gotten um uh, a very small amount in on our operating costs only 120 dollars this month we need to get at least 200 dollars in this week here in the next day or so uh just to keep us floating along and to keep everything going um you know, we have operating costs coming up at the end of the first of the month. So uh, we also have the, it's also our 10-year anniversary fundraiser for the Global Reality. We're trying to get some new gear and new stuff in here before the film is done so we can incorporate it in and make that movie even better. Uh, you can buy gift cards for that or make donations there. You'll find links to all the fundraisers here on the Read More tab of the YouTube video and in the comment section on YouTube. You can also find links to all the fundraisers at our Facebook pages. So if you're wondering, if you go on my website, you don't see them there. Again, as I've said, the website sucks. It doesn't get updated properly. So you can find all the donation stuff. You can also use the donate button, use any kind of credit card you want or a debit card or Visa prepaid card at the website. You can use the donate button there as well. Um, and, you know, please go and make a donation so we can get some new gear in here and make a donation towards our operating costs if you want. And also if you want to get some crystals for us on let there be rocks, but uh, I just, you know, we're basically down to zero here after getting all the bills paid and everything this month and trying to get ahead, and now here we are again, because as, as I said, when I don't do shows, we just flat don't get the support that we need as I'm trying to make a film, so, but I'm, I'm working my ass off, and I'm trying to get this thing done, and it's going to be amazing, and uh, I've got some more surprises and more announcements coming up for stuff very soon that thing's going to make you all happy out there but i just uh i don't know i, I it's tough man i've um uh, it just every time i make a film it it just becomes tougher and tougher because you know you just oftentimes don't feel like you've got very many people in your corner, so. And I've been kind of feeling like that a lot. Like I feel like I've been doing all this work, and at the end of the day, it's going to mean nothing, you know, even once the movie's out and everything, and it's like all this, all this fucking sacrifice, you know. So I, I just need people out there to, to, to just show me that I'm not alone in this. I know I'm not, but. I've just been feeling that way because we just haven't got hardly anything in this month and it's just tough. It's, you know, it's just tough to work and where I, I doubt any of you would work a, a job for 10 years and have no benefits and no paycheck at the end of the week like I've done, you know. 
I don't want anything but the ability to be able to keep doing this. That's what I want. And, you know, when we don't get that, it makes it, you know, it makes it tough. I tried to, we tried to have the, you know, fundraiser Friday again and try to get everybody to contribute. Nobody contributed jack shit. Um, so we just need everybody. If you're, if you stand with me right now, you need to prove it. Go and buy some gift cards for us for on our 10 year anniversary fundraiser. Throw a, a contribution to that. Cause again, you know, when I say our work and support our work, I mean, support me and the other people out there that contribute and, and keep this thing going and have kept this thing going for the past 10 years. And I salute every one of you and I love each and every one of you that's contributed and donated and helped us out. And uh, so I'm definitely not talking to you, but all the other people out there who can contribute and haven't, we need you to step up and become a part of this because there aren't too many grassroots efforts anymore, folks, that haven't been completely compromised and absorbed into the agenda. And we're trying to fight this agenda on multiple fronts here and always have and, and always will. And my track record of, you know, close to 10 fully documentary films, 15 audio books, thousands, countless radio shows, interviews of the past 10 years, and never using fear, never trying to sell you products. We don't have to make you sit through commercials. People don't know how, how good they've got it with what I do. And uh, I can tell you it's not always going to be that way. There will be a day eventually where I'll have to monetize everything and it will eventually probably get to the point where, you know, because I've, I've got to be able to survive. And this honor system thing of, with, of asking people to donate and support our work is just not working. So we're going to have to start finding other ways to, you know, force capital injections, which is, you know, charging people for the shows and all the rest, which is coming. So anyway, all the people who don't stand with me and don't really give a shit about the truth, you can expect me and everybody else to feel the same way about you. On the other hand, if you believe in the real truth and you believe in wanting to find the deeper elements that have been hidden from us, and want to keep future generations from falling into the same shit we fell for, I need you to stand with me. Just go and contribute whatever you can right now. We'll see you next time. Take care.